Hey, so I'm here with uh, Sergeant from Phalanx Games uh, at PunchCon, uh, and I came over for you to talk to me a bit about uh, 1920 Nest of Eagles. Yep. Uh, and just to give a bit of a demo of this upcoming game from, uh, from Phalanx Game. Good, so can you uh, present us the, a bit the situation? I guess if it's 1920, it's probably the Russo-Polish War? Yes, yes. Uh, Polish-Soviet War, yes. as we would uh, like to call it. It is the opening phase of that conflict. Well, three turns into it, three weeks into the conflict. As you can see right here, we have two fronts uh, represented in this game. That is the way it was historically uh, played. Soviets had two fronts the Southwestern Front and the Western Front. Those fronts didn't, didn't exactly uh, work well together, or at least their commanders didn't work well together, which means, as a Soviet player, you'll be playing two distinct commands, yeah. and each will be facing a different uh, situation on the front. Uh, as for Poles, you get to control everything uh, at once, and this is why you can play this game as three a three-player game. Awesome. Since uh, the Soviets can do uh, can be played by two players, Poles by one player. And, and as it, it turned out, uh, it plays really well with three players. And does it mean that in a three-player uh, scenario, for example, that only one of the Soviet players is going to win, or they have to win together? Actually, that depends on the scenario. Yeah. This game comes with nine scenarios, uh, including the, the main campaign one. And in the main campaign one, it is indeed that what you said. Yeah. Uh, one player can win and the other one, uh, well, well, he will suffer during the Great Purge of yes. 1936-7, right? <laughs> As I mentioned, this is the beginning of the, almost the beginning of the conflict. And in that, uh, that, that beginning of the conflict is extremely interesting from gaming perspective and historical, historical perspective as well, since on this front, the Poles are on the offensive, while on this one, they are definitely on the defensive. So you'll, you'll be actually playing two games at the, uh, at the same time. Uh, until a certain po moment in the, in, uh, in the scenario, where the tables will turn on that front. Yeah. And then it will probably go uh, the historical way. Poles will have to retreat and establish a line along the Vistula, or hopefully somewhere further yeah. east. And, and so this is covering the whole uh, the whole war. It's not and just a not actually not the entire entire war, yeah. but the most, the most critical, critical. six months of the yes. war. Okay, everything happened in that six months that yeah. was of any uh, of note. Yeah. Okay, but that looks uh, that looks great. Can you tell us a bit about the the system, how it works? So it looks like a hex encounter, but it looks a bit different than from yes. a classical hex encounter. So I guess there is going to be some... Uh... Yes, hexagonal counters are probably what you're thinking about. Yes. Because they are definitely different. Why are they hexagonal? Well, there is a reason for that, a very specific reason. And this is because of those triangles here that go around the hex. They represent uh, lines of friction that units generate. Well, some of them generate, some, some don't. This one does not generate yeah. any lines of friction. Now, lines of friction in, the, in this game are kind of like um, an alternate version of zones of control. Yeah. This game does not have zones of control, instead lines of friction. What it means is you can freely enter what you would normally consider a zone of control, but this, it doesn't mean anything. But if you, you want to move uh, across the line, which is generated yeah. through those portions of the uh, hex, uh, you, you hex cross line. the line of friction. Yeah, if you cross that, then first of all, you, you apply, um, you will apply a penalty for movement, and also in combat, if it happens that you uh, retreat across such a line, you will suffer. Uh, let's take this unit here. You will suffer a step loss. Uh, if you retreat through a line of friction, you, you suffer a step, step, yeah. step loss. Typically in combat, you won't be able to inflict many step losses. Not through combat itself. Yeah. Unless you happen to roll two, two, ones. two ones or two sixes. Okay. Uh, or unless your strength ratio to the, uh, the attacker's strength ratio to defender's strength ratio is extremely well yeah. good. You, what you will be trying to achieve is that envelopment where you force the enemy to go through lines of friction. And this is where st step loss occurs. Uh, the idea here is you can never uh, 
amass more than eight uh, strength uh, yeah. points in one combat, either on the attacker side or the defender side. So even though the stacking limit is, uh, is actually four, that won't give you anything, because the maximum strength points you can use in any combat is eight and no more. Okay. And what you'll be looking at is your strength, strength points and defender strength points, and then you cross-reference the number right here. Let's say eight against, in this situation, that would be, uh, sorry, that would be eight against four. So we're looking at here and there. Cross-reference gives us nine. Obviously, there are modifiers for rivers, for tough terrain, yeah. for other, other elements that you would commonly find in games such as this. Then you roll die, roll, roll two dice, and the result you need is exactly that, nine or, or less. less. Okay. Yeah. If you fail, well, nothing happens. Mm. No, nobody moves, nobody suffers a loss. Uh, however, you will um, have an additional effect. If you, if you succeed, the, unit, the enemy units must retreat mm. two hexes. And as so I mentioned, if, it, if they cross the line of yeah. friction, they get a step Bent. loss, right? But in addition to that, we have this morale advantage track, which yeah. is kind of interesting because it determines the, uh, it may determine, determine the victory conditions, not for one or two scenarios, but most of them, yeah. and especially for the campaign. The, Pol the Poles and the Soviets would try to, to move that up as high as possible. Now, the idea here is, if you win a combat, this moves in your direction. There are three, three markers representing three theaters of operation. The Lithuanian Belarusian one, Ukrainian one, and the Polish uh, theater of operation. So whenever you succeed, for example, you've succeeded as a Soviet, uh, you get one plus one box in your direction. If you fail in, a, in the attack, it goes down. Yeah. It goes in, uh, to Polish, Polish favors. Yeah. favor. And if you manage to get uh, that marker up to, let's say, for, for, uh, for your advantage, uh, to this, this spot, uh, that will benefit you um, in combat, but only for, uh, in attack. Mm. Uh, that will give you plus one modifier to attack. In addition, that may bring you some victory points or, uh, well, make you succeed in, a, in the larger campaign. Yeah. How, how long is the game over? So you said you had nine oh, yes. scenarios, so... Yes, nine scenarios, so... What is the shortest scenario and what is the, the whole campaign? Uh, the think? shortest one would be the Miracle on the Vistula, yeah. which is free. Three rounds. Three yeah. rounds. Uh, so that's three to eight rounds for, well, eight, eight nine rounds for, for scenarios. most of scenarios. For those uh, uh, smaller scenarios. So and eight, eight of those. Um, and the whole campaign takes, well, it's uh, 20, 20 something uh, uh, turns. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how long, long it plays, it's uh, half an hour per turn. Okay. Tra typically half an hour per turn, which means you can do all of those scenarios uh, in an afternoon, but the campaign will, uh, will need Would to. Be a convention. Yeah, you need, exactly. You'll need at least a day. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, there may be a point to where you say, no, I'm not going to win, and yes. no, I'm go not going to do, do much more. But yeah, eight scenarios gives you a lot of variety, because they, they cover lots of interesting parts of the, uh, of the game. You can also have a one scenario which, it, which takes two-thirds of, of the whole campaign. Yeah. You can start, start that mini campaign, so yeah, to okay. say, right here. And that definitely is doable inside a day. Yeah, okay, that's really interesting. And what is this turn structure like? Is it I go, you go, or...? Yes, or is it, we have yeah. a twist, we have a twist. Okay. Uh, it goes like this. You, the, the player with the initiative, uh, the first player, uh, gets to do everything um, in their turn, and then it goes to the Soviet, yeah. uh, to, the, uh, to the next player, uh, he goes through everything. However, uh, there are four phases. Uh, four standard phases in, uh, in the game. Yeah. First attack phase, operational movement phase, second attack phase, and then replacement phase. Mm. Well, not a lot of, lot of stuff happens. What's, but what, what's interesting about this game is there is a movable re uh, um, reactive movement phase, mm. which can come bet between those oh, yeah. okay. three first phases. Before the first one, in between uh, yeah. the first and second, in between sec second and third. And that reactive movement phase allows you, for example, to move before that first attack uh, to get yourself in a best, better position. However, the opponent can do his reactive move in your turn. Mm. 
So he's kind of reactive to what your react. Uh, his rea uh, that's that's his reaction to your uh, plans, to your movements, to your attacks. And with uh, as you, as I mentioned, there are two attack phases, and they are kind of different. The first one is easier. The second one comes after operational movement, mm -hmm. and. Uh, your chance of success is minus three, yeah. and uh, it's more difficult. So it becomes harder and harder. Yeah, it becomes harder. Uh, but if you need to do that, if you want to take a risk, mm. then this is the moment uh, to do it. And obviously, after the first attack, you may want to push forward yeah. with that second and hope for the better result. And uh, those two movements, while they are basically the same, there are some restrictions. When it comes to a reactive movement, you cannot move a unit facing uh, an, an opponent with more strength than, than, um, okay. than you. So, in, yeah. for instance, yeah, let's, let's take that example again. Uh, this is what you've got. Now, this, you, you get this stack, stack yes, yeah. that, okay. that stack can do a reactive movement because it's it has eight, eight strength mm -hmm. against four. So, it will be able to move uh, in a standard way. Now, this one won't be able to move because he's facing twice the, the number yeah. of uh, strength points. For operational movement, if you've attacked in the first um, uh, first attack phase, then you place a marker like this that shows you you've made an attack and you won't be able to, to move again in the operational yeah. phase. Other than that, uh, those two op uh, movement phases are basically the same. Okay, so that's actually a pretty simple rule set. Yes, but it, I guess it all comes from the like a very complex situation and yeah, it, it tries to represent uh, yes. a complex situation. Well, and you're that only go giving damage yes. by going through lines of friction. Yeah, That's the and only way. no, no, there's another way. Yeah, uh, if you retreat in the wrong direction, by wrong direction I mean west for poles. Yeah, is east. the west for poles and east for Soviets is the right direction. So if you happen to move like this. That's one step loss. Okay. And because you're treating for two hexes, it's possible to, um, to get Stuck. Four, yeah. four step losses. Of course, if you're encircled, mm. you're going to suffer more, as with any other game. If you cross a river above the bridge by, while retreating, yeah. you also suffer a step loss, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of chances to surround your enemy and try to take him out this way. Okay. But this game also, also has... Um, uh, re a replacement system that depends on uh, on your offensive capability. Well, what you did in your uh, turn. Yeah. If you don't attack on your front or on your theater of operations, you will get two replacement points. Yeah. If you attack once or twice, you'll get just one replacement. Yeah. And if you do an all-out offensive, which means three or more attacks, no replacements are coming. Yeah. That works separately for each uh, front and somewhat separately for poles, because they kind of count it all together, yeah. and you have a number from four to zero. Plus the Soviets get, the Soviets always get one replacement that they can uh, apply to one of those yes. fronts. Okay. And replacement can allow you to strengthen a unit that's uh, that weakened, that's spent, reduced, yeah. or recreate a, a unit from scratch. But um, uh, th those markers are used as replacements. As if it happens that the enemy manages to to move that unit, so attack it and uh, force it to retreat, you then you lose that you lose replacement, replacement yeah. and they're not replaced. Yeah. Ah, yeah, so you have to commit to the fact that you're going to replace, yes. and as the, uh, the opponent can actually try to yes. disrupt that replacement. Exactly. Okay, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And you obviously have some supplies. Yeah. Supplies come from, tra uh, from uh, uh, railroads, uh, uh, towns with railroads, really. Those are those uh, star... Uh, that, that, those, those stars are... are points. Or or, no, no, those yeah. are of uh, um, uh, Con Army, okay. which is going to arrive in full strength okay. on one of those stars in, in a certain moment at, in the game. Now, Con Army is the most powerful uh, force in the game. Elite cavalry with four, full strength, and uh, they, loot up, they, they can do a lot of damage. Yeah. Um, there's one other thing. Uh, since I mentioned Con Army, there are different special units um, on the Soviet side, and on the Polish side, including Ukrainians, because obviously we are fighting here in yes. Ukraine. Um, well, that's it, really, yeah. uh, when it comes to this game. But that looks uh, great. Simple rule set, but a lot of uh, tactical implications. Yeah, yeah. Do you have an idea of when it will be released, or for now it's just on pre-order and you're waiting to see the numbers? Oh, no, no, no. It's going to be released this year, 
should happen in, uh, let's say, four or five months. Okay. I cannot be sure because yeah. it's not exactly, it doesn't depend exactly on me. I'm yes. a developer yeah, yeah. and I hope to finish it by the end of May. Okay. All, all, the, all the work, graphic and so on. But, uh, well, printing house, production, that's yeah, yeah. not my forte and yeah, yeah. I'm not entirely sure when that's going to come. But within the year? Y yes, definitely this year. Okay, but well, that's great. Thanks a lot, Sergey, for yeah, showing sure, me the, sure. the game and uh, really excited to see it uh, being released. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Bye.